Okay, well, perhaps we should start. It's a very sultry evening here, and I suspect also in Israel and other places besides. Although we have a very large number signed up, I suspect some will perhaps choose to listen to the recording afterwards, but I'm going to keep an eye on the waiting room and of course let people in as they as they arrive. Very good. Well, as the director of the Insiders Outsiders Project, um, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you this evening to a talk by Mary Claire Adam, who is the daughter of precisely one of the figures being celebrated in the Insiders Outsiders Project. If uh, I can just fill you in slightly for those of you who haven't come across the project before, it was a sort of brainchild of mine, I have to <laughs> say, some while ago now, but it was a started off life as a nationwide, UK-based, nationwide, year-long arts festival designed to pay tribute to the rich and diverse cultural contribution of refugees from Nazi Europe to this country's culture. And come March 2020, when thank goodness it was meant to end anyway, more or less, COVID happened, we had to rethink the way we do things. And I hesitate to say this, but actually the lockdown has given the project an unexpectedly rich afterlife in the form of a program, an ongoing program of online events, which of course have the, you know, it's not ideal way of communicating, but it has the wonderful advantage of being able to enlist so many speakers and indeed audiences from across the world. Uh, not so easy with Australia. We're aware that today Australian colleagues and friends will not be able to listen live, uh, but for the most part, it's lovely to have such international audiences for these events. Um, one of the things I've also been very keen to do, as well as sort of paying tribute to the individuals um, of that extraordinary generation, is also to give the second and indeed actually third generations as well, a voice. And sometimes they're artists themselves whose work engages with the um, uh, their experiences, the experiences of their families. And as in the case of Mary Claire, we have somebody who is currently doing more research about her father's remarkable life. So it's a, been a rich, a rich mix. And uh, we have another event, I'll say just briefly before I forget, at um, eight o'clock this evening by a much younger Mary Claire, no, no, nothing personal here, but a young woman who's actually the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, a poet and artist called Dante Elsner. So another example, we put the two together quite, uh, quite sort of knowingly uh, as part of this ongoing um, preoccupation with, you know, letting younger voices and uh, second and third generation representatives have, have, have their say. Very good. So without further ado, let me just admit, um, a few people waiting here. And let me tell you a little bit about Mary Claire by way of introduction. Uh, she was born in Australia. The Australian connection is obviously strong. She spent many years in England where she worked at the Wiener Library under the very eminent uh, Walter Lacour, who many of you will have heard about, no doubt. Returning to Australia, she studied anthropology at Monash University. And inspired by her father, Leonard Adam, which of course is the subject of her talk today, she did field work in Papua New Guinea, where she lived for several years. She now divides her time between Vienna, of course, in Austria, and Israel, where she's the honorary consul of the Solomon Islands. And I was expressing my curiosity about that. It sounds wonderfully Graham Greene-like honorary consul uh, of the Solomon Islands. Uh, most directly relevant to today's talk, she's currently immersed in writing a biography of her father, Leonard Adam, together with Professor Robin Sloggart of the University of Melbourne. I think that's enough by way of preamble, except to just repeat my request that you stay muted, please. And when it comes to asking questions, and I hope you will do so, please do type them into the chat. I'm sure you all know the ropes by now. Address to me, Monica Bohm Dooch, and so we don't distract Mary Claire while she's talking. Lovely. So I think um, without further ado, over to you, Mary Claire, and welcome. Thank you very much, Monica, for your kind words and introduction. And hello to you all from a wonderful midsummer's evening in Tel Aviv. Thank you very much, Monica, for giving me, for inviting me to speak about my remarkable father, Leonhard Adam, who because of what happened in Germany in the 1930s, went from being Supreme Court Justice to refugee in an internment camp in Australia. My father was born in Berlin in the last decade of the 19th century. He grew up at a time of emancipation tolerance and intellectual freedom for all, which characterized Germany prior to World War I 
and even after that war, existed in part in Germany all through the 1920s. The Jews enjoyed full civic rights, were permitted to attend whichever school they wished, go in for whichever profession they wanted to, marry whoever they wanted to, etc. My father lived in Ansbacher Strasse, in the center of what was later to become West Berlin. His mother Katharina was born in Berlin and his father, Michael Meinhardt, a textile merchant, was born in Schrimm in the Eastern province of Posen, which is today's Poznan in Poland. Berlin was the great welcoming capital city and my grandfather and his brothers and sisters all moved there in the 1880s. My father was sent to the Kaiser Friedrich Wilhelms Gymnasium and given private lessons in piano and painting. In fact, his painting teacher was a leading artist in Germany and was a student of Adolf Schlabitz, who was the teacher of Lionel Feininger. Inspired by his history teacher at his high school, who took a group of boys to visit the Berlin Museum of Ethnology, my father became deeply interested in tribal and ethnic art at the age of 16. In fact, he used to rush to the Berlin Museum of Ethnology after school most days in order to sketch the objects in the various departments. He began in the Northwest American Indian section where his deep understanding of that part of the world began. His first published book was on Northwest America, Tribal Organization and Leadership of the Haida and Shimshian, which appeared in 1913. He also spent hours sketching in the Oceania section and began a lifelong interest in art of the South Pacific, in particular, New Guinea and the Sepik River. This inspired me to spend much of five years in Papua New Guinea, especially on the Sepik River. This is a photograph which was taken for the special edition of the Journal of Comparative Law, which he had edited for many years up until 1938. There was a special edition to celebrate his 65th birthday. After completing, his high school exams, my father wanted nothing more than to study the developing subject of anthropology. However, his parents and others had never heard the word anthropology and insisted that he study law. He approached the esteemed Joseph Kola, professor of law and expert in comparative law at Berlin University to accept him as a student. Kola assured him that he could study indigenous cultures via law, i.e. first general legal studies, then specialize in comparative legal systems. This he did. And at the same time, he studied Asian languages, Sanskrit, and particularly Mandarin Chinese, obtaining a diploma as translator of Mandarin into German. He also studied Hindi, which was of great assistance when he interviewed Indian prisoners of war in the internment camps in Germany and Romania in World War I. After graduating in law, he entered the Berlin District Court. In 1914, he was seconded as a clerk to a Berlin military court, all the while continuing his studies with Kohler. Joseph Kohler had convinced the German authorities that it would be a great opportunity for Germany if the prisoners of war from the British colonies could be interviewed and recorded, singing their traditional songs, and perhaps even convinced to switch sides. With this in mind, those particular prisoners were kept in the most humane conditions, and a mosque, the very first in Germany, was built in the internment camp at Wunsdorf, outside Berlin. The prisoners were encouraged to grow vegetables, to raise chickens, the Christian prisoners to go to church. The church was outside the camp, but they actually left the camp on Sundays to go to church and also encouraged to play games, including football. I've seen a letter from one of the prisoners to his mother 
and he writes about how well he was treated. Kohler established the Royal Prussian Phonographic Commission, aimed at recording the prisoners speaking and singing. My father worked with him on this project and was thrilled at this opportunity to do field work. He interviewed Sikh prisoners, picking out more than a passing knowledge of Punjabi language from them. Nepalese Gurkhas, he based his book, Law and Custom in Nepal, on the notes he took from those interviews and Australian Aboriginal prisoners. There were two Aborigines, Douglas Grant and Roland Carter. With Carter, he formed a lasting friendship and the play, Mayway 3027, by Australian playwright Glenn Shea is based on this very special relationship. The play has been performed at various venues in Australia, including the Adelaide Festival, now in the form of uh, reading, play reading, but it's very much hoped to bring it into full production. The 1920s, and in particular 1923, were a prolific time of writing for my father. He published four books in 1923, Northwest American Indian Art, The Oil Lamps of Nepal, High Art of Asia, and Buddha Statues. All this time, he was editing the Journal of Comparative Law, first of Joseph Kohler's assistant and then solely, as well as the Handbook of Ethnology. He was also active as a judge. In the early 1920s, my father used to go on holiday to the island of Rügen and to Hiddensee, a neighboring island in the Baltic. This beautiful painting was done in Hiddensee in September 1921. Four, uh, five years ago, my daughter Bacha and I went to Hiddensee in search of these cliffs. We believe we located them behind the lighthouse in Dornbusch. In 1933, the Nazis' decision to Aryanize all positions held by Jews stripped him of his position in the High Court and also removed him from the Board of Experts at the Berlin Museum of Ethnology. However, he was able to continue editing the journal and the handbook for the following few years, since they were considered to be private projects. In 1934, he made his first trip to Britain. He had been corresponding for some time with academics in his field, some of whom had invited, he had invited to be on the editorial board of his two publications. And they in turn invited him to lecture at their universities London, Oxford and Cambridge, and also at the Royal Anthropological Institute and the London School of Economics. And here are a few images of his sketches of 1934, um, going on to paintings from 1939. So, um, London Fog, Sorry, sorry. Sorry, London fog, which I think is um, very atmospheric. And I'm glad to say that London never looks like that anymore, but it certainly did in 1934. And this is a sketch of Whitechapel also 1934, and the Berwick Street Market. Now, the last time I was in that area, Berwick Street Market looked exactly like that. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Dewhurst the Butcher, um, that is if they still exist. He continued to lecture in Britain over the next few years until in Berlin in early 1938, which was the year when he was elected fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He was warned that his name had appeared on a list of people to be liquidated. 
he decided immediately to leave Germany for good and to go to England. In England, his friends, such as Robert Ranulph Marrett, rector of Exeter College, Oxford, and Charles Seligman of the London School of Economics, invited him to lecture and also found him a job in the Institute of Education, London University in May, 1939. He did some wonderful sketches and watercolors of London, Oxford and elsewhere in England. Sorry. So this is the Norbury, Tennis Club Norbury in London, SW16. And he had very good friends there and often spent weekends in Norbury. And strangely enough, several decades later, my mother and I bought a house very close to Norbury. The old rectory in Beaconsfield, Buckinghamshire, may also be well known to many of you because I think the building still looks exactly the same, although it has been converted into luxury apartments. Here, Hastings in Sussex, he loved going to the coast. Now, he was already an authority on tribal art, and he had been contracted by Penguin Books to write primitive art. Sorry, <laughs> the Caledonian market, I had to show you this. He used to go to the Caledonian market very often, where he bought many of the wonderful little pieces that I now have in Tel Aviv, little Indian bronzes, etc. He also bought the wonderful Nepalese oil lamps that he has at the Caledonian market, which unfortunately no longer exists. Now, Primitive Art was the book he wrote in 1940, um, contracted by Penguin Books. He had used his time in 1939 to do lots of research research of the ethnographical collections in the British Museum. And photographs from the museum's collections are illustrated in primitive art, as well as sketches of actual pieces that he did himself. The book, as I said, published in 1940, became a bestseller and went through several editions. It was translated into French, Italian, Spanish in Mexico and Spanish in Buenos Aires, and Serbo-Croat. Coinciding with the 80th anniversary of the first edition of Primitive Art, it has just been translated into Mandarin Chinese by an anthropologist in Beijing, Professor Xiu Jian Li, who invited me to write the preface. In Primitive Art, my father writes about art and origins of art all over the world. There are chapters on Northern Africa, Bushman art, Central, East and West African art, Asia, including prehistoric art of Java, China and Japan, as well as Siberia and Central Asia. He also compares art done for utilitarian purposes and art done for the sake of art by artists known by name. His chapter on primitive art and psychoanalysis was quoted by Claude Levi-Strauss in his book, Structural Anthropology in 1958. Although World War II had broken out, my father was able to lead a pretty normal life, lecturing and working in England. He was thus reestablishing himself very happily in England, when suddenly on the 15th of May, 1940, everything changed. He was arrested as an enemy alien and interned in various internment camps, including in Douglas, Isle of Man. His painting of the internment camp there shows barbed wire and lots of concrete no greenery whatsoever, no flowers, no nothing. And perhaps because there were no flowers, 
he decided to do a series of still life panels, oil painting, oil paint on masonite of flowers. Now, there are five panels actually all together. This is quite a remarkable story. I didn't know anything about these panels until I received a letter not so long ago from an unknown lady who asked whether I was the daughter of Leonhard Adam. And um, we corresponded and she told me that a friend of her late mother's, Walter Boma, who'd been a prisoner interned on the Isle of Man and had become friendly with my father, had been given these panels by my father when my father was sent to the internment camp near Liverpool. And he, Walter Boma, couldn't be sent because he happened to be in hospital in Douglas, Isle of Man. So he looked after these paintings. He left them to his friend. She passed away, left them to her daughter. And the message was always to try and find the descendants of Leonhard Adam. So not so long ago, on a trip to England, I met this wonderful lady, Kath Pierce, at a friend of hers, actually a relative of hers home, and I was presented with these gorgeous panels. In July 1940, my father, his brother, and about 2,500 others were taken from the Isle of Man, moved to Highton Camp near Liverpool, and then put on the Denira, which left Liverpool on the 10th of July, 1940. The Denira was a rather new ship at the time, having completed her maiden voyage in 1937. It is just unbelievable how this quite new ship could have become a filthy floating jail in such a short time. The ship could hold a thousand officers and enlisted men. On this voyage, 2,500 internees were crammed into the front and back holds, while 251 actual Nazi prisoners were given cabins and treated very well as prisoners of war, uh, according to the Geneva Convention. The internees were treated abominably. They had been permitted to bring one piece of luggage on board ship with them. This was confiscated immediately as were all watches and items of jewelry, such as wedding rings. Somehow or other, my father was able to bring his paints with him, his watercolors with him. And I can only think that the sailors just let them go since they were of no value. My father's health suffered forever after the Denira experience. And he used to refer to the ship as that hell ship. Among those put on the Denira were many survivors of the sinking of the Arundora Star. This was a ship of the Blue Star Line, which had set sail for Canada some days earlier and been torpedoed in the Irish Sea. Many lives were lost, and the description of those many hours in the freezing sea is horrific. The survivors were assured they would not be put on another ship, yet eight days later, they found themselves on the Denira and ironically, whereas the Arundora Star had offered them comfortable accommodation, conditions on the Denira were appalling. The Denira internees had been told they were going to Canada like the Arundora Star. However, when the Denira stopped in Sierra Leone, West Africa, they realized they were not going to Canada and most likely to the former British penal colony of Australia. Now, here is a painting I discovered not long ago, the only painting my father did from the Denira. This is the coast of Sierra Leone. Here in Freetown, the crew went ashore, taking many of the internees' suitcases and personal items with them. These they sold and all returned absolutely drunk to the ship. The first Australian port for the Denira was Fremantle, Western Australia. When the Australian health officials boarded the ship, they were shocked to see the poor condition of the men 
who had been deprived of sunlight for weeks and fed on the most meager rations. Occasionally, they were forced to run on the deck over broken bottles. The next port of call was Melbourne on the 3rd of September, 1940. And here, all the men in category B, as well as the Italian internees and the Arundora star survivors were taken off the ship. My father and his brother Manfred were in category B. At the time of internment in England, the men were put into categories. A was considered highly dangerous. B was not dangerous, but had restricted freedom and could not travel more than five miles without police permission. C was harmless and exempt from any restrictions. Most of the Denira boys were in category C and those went on to Sydney. From there to internment at Hay in central New South Wales. The climate was so bad at Hay that the camp was later shut down and all the internees were moved to Tatura. The Tatura climate was said to be better, but like Hay, also subject to dust storms. My father painted this descriptive watercolor in 1941. Quite amazing, I think. There were four camps in Tatura and each consisted of corrugated iron huts. And each was surrounded by barbed wire, the four camps. Life in Tatura also involved doing physical education, physical exercises every morning. They were very lucky that they had with them an internee called Franz Stampfel. Franz Stampfel was a very well-known athlete in Germany. And later he became the athletics coach of the Australian Olympic team in the 1956 Olympics in Melbourne. Close to Tatura, there was this um, reservoir called Waranga Basin, and there was a quarry. And the men used to go there and collect stones to fetch rocks, actually, and bring back to the camps. It's from here that stone for the monument to the Arundora star was taken. This is rather beautiful monument. You see the wave, the huge wave that engulfed the ship. When Tatura camps were disbanded, the owner of that area destroyed the monument. However, there was this painting by my father and it was decided to erect a new monument to the Arundora star victims. And it's modeled on my father's painting. And the stone for the new monument was also taken from Waranga Basin. In Tatura, my father and other academics decided to found a university, Collegium Taturensis. My father was the pro-rector. In the tradition of old European universities, diplomas were given in Latin. A range of subjects was taught, and my father taught anthropology, Mandarin Chinese, and comparative law. Academic level at this university was so high that later on, graduates from there were accepted into Australian universities without the need to pass further examinations. My father's colleagues around the world, together with various organizations in Australia, including the Refugee Internees Welfare Association, of which my mother was the secretary, petitioned the Australian authorities to release him. And after a year and a half in Tatura, he was indeed released. He was released to catalogue the objects in the Australian Ethnological Collection in the National Museum of Victoria. The objects had been collected by Sir Baldwin Spencer. At that time, my father lived at Queen's College, University of Melbourne. There he gave classes in Mandarin Chinese, becoming the first person to teach Mandarin at the University of Melbourne. He was then given a position in the history department of the University of Melbourne, lecturing in anthropology. 
He also gave annual lectures in the departments of law and finance. And I hear that they were quite, quite uh, an event and always packed. It had been his dream to found a museum of indigenous objects and his proposal to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts for such a museum was approved. He was given a room in the history department and began to form the basis of the collection. Among the first objects to arrive was a collection of bark paintings from Groote Island, Northern Territory, which my father commissioned from the superintendent of the mission there. My father and colleagues used to go out on field trips collecting Aboriginal stone tools. These two formed the basis of his museum. I remember accompanying him as a little girl and actually finding a marvelous stone ax which went into the university collection. Many museum collections around the world have been built up through exchanging objects with other museums. And my father realized that this would perforce be the way his museum could grow. There was almost no money available from university funds for purchasing objects. And generally the days of the great donations in Australia had not yet begun. Since bark paintings are both authentic objects of Aboriginal art and also very attractive, my father asked the superintendent of both of Groot Island and the missions at Milingimbi and Yurikala to send down bark paintings for the purpose of exchange, as well as for building up the museum he was creating. Beautiful bark paintings were sent to the Museum of Natural History in New York the museum in Vancouver, the Basel Museum, the University of California in Berkeley, and very many others in many parts of the United States, as well as Europe, and to the Miklucho Maklai Institute in then Leningrad. In return, marvelous objects for the Northwest coast of America, from Russian Siberia and many other parts of the world were received. The fact that my father was able to establish a museum of over 2,500 objects was quite a feat, considering the fact that he had an annual budget of just 50 Australian pounds. He often found pieces he recommended the university buy, and when his suggestion was turned down, he would buy the piece himself and donate it to the museum, becoming the first significant donor. He constantly published articles in learned journals and magazines. In 1944, he wrote a groundbreaking article, Has Aboriginal Art a Future? In which he advocated that Aborigines take their traditional designs and depict them on European style media, such as carpets, pottery, and on canvas. It was his opinion that the marvelous art designs of the Aborigines portrayed in this way would bring them income they would not otherwise have. He felt that art was the way in which Aborigines would be able to compete in the modern world. In this, my father definitely saw into the future. Little could he have imagined what huge sums Western desert dot paintings would fetch on the world art market within 30 years after his death, even within 15 years of his death. In 1955, my father led a University of Melbourne expedition to Central Australia to document Aboriginal rock paintings and engravings recently rediscovered by another Donera boy, Douglas Burnham. I went along and vividly remember that trip. While on the trip, my father painted this evocative painting, The Road to Andulia. Ah, sorry, that's, uh, sorry, let's go back a uh, second. I, I missed that one, which I think is rather lovely. Tatura Camp 2 at night. I think it's extremely beautiful. Um, he's in Camp 3 and looking through at Camp 2. And I want you to see that there are some eucalyptus trees in the distance, which do not have leaves, and those had been ring barked 
to kill them and to collect the wood later. And he was absolutely horrified that such a thing would happen. And he wrote on the back of several of his paintings, um, beautiful eucalyptus tree is deliberately murdered by people. Anyway, back to Central Australia. This is a painting I really love. This shows the, the real feeling of Central Australia, the, the dirt road, the mountains in the distance, the wide expanses. We really enjoyed our time in Central Australia, millions of flies notwithstanding. All the while that my father was at the University of Melbourne building up his museum and lecturing, he was also helping to run a home. We lived in a rambling house in Brighton near the sea. Although he had never had a garden, my father loved gardening and himself planted several of the fruit trees which bore fruit such as almond, lemon, apricot, cherry plum, fig, his greatest relaxation was to work in the garden. In this painting of the back of the house, you see a merry-go-round. Now that merry-go-round was hired to celebrate my fourth birthday. So all my little friends had a wonderful time on the real merry-go-round, which in those days had real wooden horses. At the bottom of our street was the sea. We had a wonderful beach, Middle Brighton Beach, and in the distance you see Middle Brighton Pier. In the years of my early childhood, my father and I used to go for long walks with our Scottish Terrier Angus. And I well remember our stopping beside certain trees and my father speaking to them, to which they all used to reply. My father was somewhat of a ventriloquist and I truly believed that the trees were speaking. This used to happen every night in our home when I climbed the stairs to say good night to a magnificent statue from New Ireland, Papua New Guinea. The statue always used to speak to me. I have the statue with me now in Tel Aviv and I always think back to those wonderful nights when he and I used to converse. At night, I would hear my father typing. This was the only free time he had for working on his magnum opus, Arts of Primitive Peoples, part of the Pelican World History of Art, edited by Nicholas Pevsner. My father spent the last 15 years of his life on the book. Each continent had a separate chapter. However, each chapter had sufficient material for an entire book. Each time he completed a chapter, Oceania, Africa, Australia, and sent it to the editor, it was returned with the comment, too long, cut. And so it went on year and year out until my father died without finishing this book. It seemed so wrong to me that he was expected to condense his material so much when the other authors in the series were allocated the same space for one single area, for example, North America as one book. Nowadays, entire books are written about tiny oceanic islands. I plan to bring out Oceania as a historical book. At the moment, Professor Robin Sloggett of the University of Melbourne, whose PhD dissertation was on my father and the museum he established, and I are collaborating on a biography of my father. And I know Monica mentioned this to you earlier. In this talk, I've highlighted events in the life journey of a man who was a product of that enlightened, highly cultured early part of the 20th century. And he might have achieved so much more had circumstances been otherwise. In his life, we see a real example of the insider outsider at times one and then the other. At the end of his life, he was again an insider. I conclude with this painting, my father did of our cottage at Kalorama in the Dandenongs outside Melbourne. He loved to sit in front, sketching the marvelous view 
over range upon range of mountains and valleys. Thank you. Uh, this is a self-portrait that he did six months after being released from Tatura. Thank you, Monica, and thank you all very much. That was absolutely wonderful, uh, Mary Claire. Would you like to stop screen sharing and then we can all see you better? <laughs> lovely. Fascinating life, beautifully presented. I'm sure that everybody will agree you have a lovely modulated way of talking. <laughs> Um, really wonderful. I mean, um, I hope there will be some questions. Please start uh, typing them in. Let me just check if anything's come in when I wasn't uh, checking. A lovely comment, yes, about the paintings, the panels being brought to you, there's, there's lovely still life images. Um, right, yes, anyway, let me perhaps start the ball rolling by asking a few questions of my own, but please everybody do, do start typing in any comments um, or, or questions you, you may have. Um, Lots of things one might pick up on. Um, did your father, or perhaps we should start, I mean, I'm very curious to know, I know that we have a very international audience um, tonight, and particularly perhaps um, people from Israel probably know very little, if anything at all, about the whole British government internment of enemy aliens episode, and in a live situation, I would ask you face to face, and I can't um, assess that. Actually, I have a question coming in, which actually I was going to ask myself, which, um, We'll come to in, in a minute, but um, it is an extraordinarily murky episode. And if I can be quite personal at this point in time, uh, you know, my parents came as teenage refugees from Central Europe. And as I was growing up, they had nothing but good to say about the country that had given them shelter. And of course, that is totally understandable. And yet, as somebody who was born in this country and is able to look perhaps more critically at what the British government actually got up to, you know, during the war years and indeed before as well. Um, I was absolutely shocked when I first encountered this episode. Um, and the Dunera in particular, I mean, I think even to this day, very few people in this country know what a terribly shameful episode the deportation, and I use that word quite, you know, sort of calculatedly, um, yes, of, of people being shipped off to Australia on the Dunera Wars. And I, I wonder, and indeed this is the question that somebody called Amy is asking, what were his lasting feelings about being, you know, the way he was treated by, by the British? Was he bitter? Was he, you know, what, what kind of, yes, how did he feel at the time? Do we know? And how did he feel in, in later life? Well, in later life, he always said he'd be very happy to go back to England on holiday which he did a few times. He said, but he would never again settle in Britain. Um, the interesting thing is he was prepared to settle in Switzerland, but, or even perhaps in Germany where he'd been offered a wonderful position not long before he died. Um, but England, no, because one story, which is absolutely terrible, he gave a lecture at the Royal Society of Arts I think on the 14th of May, 1940. And there was a British army officer there at the lecture. And the very next day, the same army officer came and supervised him being arrested. Hmm. Which of course he never forgot. I just wanted to say that um, I mentioned Douglas Burner. He was the one who rediscovered the Aboriginal cave paintings in Central Australia. Douglas Burner was only 16 years old. He had been born in England, but his mother was German and she'd never bothered to take out British nationality or a passport for him. And so he was arrested as an enemy alien, but he was completely, utterly English. Mm. And he remained bitter for the rest of his life. It's a very complex, and I mustn't go on about it too much, but if anybody's interested in finding out more and. Uh, we actually have had a number of events focusing on this internment episode as part of the Insiders Outsiders project. And there is actually a separate uh, section in, on the YouTube channel um, of, you know, about uh, focusing on internment, which you might like to uh, pursue further. Um, right, any more questions? I can't believe that there aren't any more questions. Interesting, so you're saying that he was actually contemplating taking a job in Germany towards the end of his life? Yes, uh, yes. a full professorship in Germany. Yeah. Interesting. That is really very, you know, it's it's darkly ironic, isn't it, in a way? And I yeah, suppose, yeah. Yeah. Slightly ironic, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, his colleagues, who the co-editor of the Handbook of, of Ethnology, um, no, not a Jew, a German who had remained in Germany there, um, but remained staunchly loyal to my father and corresponded with him as much as possible and invited him back to Bonn and gave him a lectureship there. And I think the professorship would have been in Bonn. And I suppose in fairness, you know, you have to think back in time. This was the early summer of 1940. There was a very real threat of imminent invasion of this island, of the UK, you know, by, by the Nazis. Um, Dunkirk had just happened. There was a fear of a fifth column. You know, in other words, you can historically speaking, justify some of the actions. And yet, and yet, you know, the profound <laughs> irony is that, you know, 90%, I mean, maybe I'm getting that slightly wrong, but, you know, the vast majority of those who were interned as so-called enemy aliens were, of course, Jewish, mostly predominantly Jewish refugees, you know, fleeing from Nazi oppression. Yeah, How can they, they possibly be, you know? Yeah, concerned? they were all thought of as Nazi spies, all of them. Mm -hmm. And Churchill used the words, collar the lot. Very yes. famous. Yes. Enough, Absolutely. Collar the lot. And later on, much later on, Churchill realized that a mistake had been made. But of course, it was too late to undo it. And there was all kinds of confusion. The internees were in Australia. Um, some of them, in fact, my father actually, a, a release had been obtained from him had he still been on the Isle of Man, but he wasn't. And the British authorities, some of them had no idea he'd been sent to Australia. So the order for the release came through, but he was already, he was in Australia mm -hmm. and the Australian authorities would not release him for a while. And they said, no, all these people are somehow illegally in Australia that Britain sent them. And now they, they're here for the time being. It's lots, of, lots of confusion. Lots of confusion, shambolic. I mean, you know, almost surreal and, and strange, so, so much of this and full of contradictions in, 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 indeed. Um, there is incidentally a book called Collar the Lot, which uh, Mary Claire, you might know about specifically on, on internment. It's, it's a hot topic. I think, you know, it's actually really important for us now to realize that the refugees then in the thirties were not treated as well as the kind of, you know, if you like the mythology of Britain being good to them would like, you know, would have us believe. So I think it's really important to be looking at it in, in detail. Now we have, yes, we have some questions coming in. Um, hold on a second. Um, right, um, somebody called Aneta Di Mosca. How are Leonard's academic interests impacted by the Genera ship experience? In other words, uh, how did his earlier interests in Berlin and Germany compare with his later ones in Australia? Well, they were very similar as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Chinese, he began in Germany and kept on all the way through and then became the first person to teach Chinese at the University of Melbourne and the other academic interests. The thing is, I didn't mention in the talk that on the Danira, where the people had nothing, no materials, no nothing, they also gave lectures in their fields. It was quite incredible. Yes, the creative life of all the internment camps, including the ones on the Isle of Man, where indeed most of the people were, were kept. I mean, just, just extraordinary. And that whole role of creativity in internment situation, of course, is a very interesting question. I mean, it was partly not having much else to do, but that's by no means the whole story, is it? I mean, I think your father obviously had real talent. I mean, what lovely images they are with a tremendous sense of design and, and rhythm to them. Um, but it's a way, isn't it, of asserting who you are as an individual in the kind of most dehumanizing of circumstances. And I hesitate mm -hmm. to say this, but you know, it is comparable to the creativity you find in other much worse internment situations, even in the concentration camps of the Third Reich, you know, that the motives are not entirely dissimilar. So that in itself is also a really interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think somebody once said that actually the Isle of Man in 1940 was probably the most important university in the world, because nearly all the eminent you know, Jewish academics from Central Europe were, were there for a while. Um, good. Um, another question. Um, Yes, about whether your father involved himself as a lawyer, um, and of course it's unusual for somebody to be able to practice law and make art, you know, and, and be an anthropologist uh, at the same time, um, but did he work in the area of refugee law at all, ever? Um, not that I know of, in fact, he practiced law only in Germany. Hmm. 
later on, lecturing in comparative law was something different. Um, and comparative law meaning studying the legal systems of Nepalese Gurkhas, for example, or the legal systems of tribal Aborigines, but not working with refugees in the legal sense, per se. There was a question earlier, actually, which I mustn't forget about, um, regarding the way that his 1940 book is now regarded, because clearly, you know, academe and times have moved on. I mean, can you say something about that, perhaps? Well, I think it's regarded very much as a landmark historical book in that subject. I mean, if you read the book and look at the cover, for example, you wouldn't use that terminology anymore. Um, but it's very much regarded as, as um, a founding book, shall I say, in the subject, which is why the anthropologist in Beijing is now translating it into Mandarin. Do you know anything more about the circumstances? I mean, what were the contacts he had that made it possible for him to be published by Pelican in 1940? Well, yes, he'd already published and given many lectures in England about tribal art. And I think Pelican were looking for an author. They wanted to have a book of that subject. And he was the logical person to ask. That's why I said he was really reestablishing himself in England. He was an insider again in England and happily there and very successfully there. And um, he was well known, very well known in that field. And so he was, as I said, the most logical person for Penguin Books to contact. Fascinating. And I hadn't realized that he was actually working on this later volume with uh, in a series edited by Pevsner. And of course, Pevsner, as you may also know, was of Jewish origin, didn't much like to admit it. But, you know, another of this remarkable um, generation of erstwhile refugees who contributed so hugely to so many different uh, disciplines, indeed. Um, Right, let's have a look. There are questions coming in thick and fast now. Uh, your father's paintings from Pamela, Meron. Your father's paintings are extremely evocative and portray events and atmospheres so poignantly. Did he continue to record his life through this medium? Oh, yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. He did, really, up until the end of his life. I have many other paintings, but I just made this selection for the talk. And they're all with you, are they, Mary Claire? I mean, where, where? Might one see them in more public places or are they mostly with the family? Ah, well, they are in Tatura where the internment camp was. There is a museum. It's called the Wartime Camps and Irrigation Museum because that's a big area of irrigation. Mm -hmm. And I presented them with 36 of his paintings, mainly paintings of the Tatura camps. There are also some paintings in the Australian War Memorial Museum and some in the Jewish Museum of Australia. There were some on exhibit in the Exiles Gallery of the Jewish Museum of Berlin. They were there for some years. And I have some here and I have some in my home in Vienna. And has there ever been a sort of a proper, you know, retrospective of his work? Um, well, there was the one at Tatura Museum and then that was a selection of paintings. And then I decided to present them with all those paintings in the exhibition, or most of them. But not and there was, the, yeah, there was one in the University of Melbourne, but quite a while ago, not recently. And in Europe, not probably. No, or, not in Europe. Not, not yet. <laughs> okay. Not yet. Yes. Um, not yet in England. Um, uh, Shifting the focus slightly, a question from our mutual friend Ella, Ella Guerra. Um, I find it fascinating that uh, your father had the idea for the Aboriginal people to use other media to paint on. Um, when I visited Australia, I saw wonderful works on canvas and paper. Can you tell us more about this? Oh, yes, because traditional paintings were either the bark paintings or actually paintings on rock shelters mm. and paintings on traditional. Uh, spirit boards uh, called Turinga stone objects with concentric circles and different designs on them. So it's strictly forbidden for Aborigines to reveal those actual designs to any uninitiated person. But my father saw how beautiful the designs are and he thought that they could take those designs, adapt them a little bit, and then paint them on 
canvas or even masonite uh, and sell those and also to weave rugs. And I don't think that took off very much and pottery also, but it's mainly the paintings that have taken off. And there, as you, I'm sure you've seen some of them, they're quite marvelous. In fact, at Quai Branly in Paris, the whole ceiling of the gift shop, it's a huge ceiling, the whole ceiling was done by an Aboriginal artist with those traditional designs, quite amazing. Were there people who opposed the idea of working in different non-traditional media? Because you could perhaps argue that it wasn't somehow right to be doing that? No, they no, they didn't oppose because the real designs are never depicted. Just some kind of hint of the real design, but adapted to be something totally secular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was fine, and it is fine. Interesting. Um, another question from Manetta. Your father clearly had a wide curiosity, to say the least, uh, that fueled his, his legal, artistic and anthropological work. Um, did he ever speak to you about why he was drawn to these particular disciplines and how this may have related to his personal life story and identity? Um, not exactly, but he always said that um, his high school teacher who took him and a group of boys to the Museum of Ethnology in Berlin. That was the turning point. He went there and he was just bowled over by those designs and those collections. And he immediately asked the authorities in the museum to let him go there and sketch the objects. And his amazement, they said yes. And they even found him a corner in the gallery with a table and a, a stool. And apparently, and he wrote in his CV, every day after school, he used to rush to the museum and sketch the objects. Um, before that, though, he was very, very interested in zoology. And he edited a journal, a zoological journal for his friends, other teenagers who were interested in snakes and alligators and crocodiles. And in fact, his long suffering parents allowed him to keep baby alligators and baby crocodiles in his apartment in Berlin, which I find absolutely amazing. I mean, what parents would do that? They must have been extraordinary parents. But he also maintained a lifelong interest in crocodiles and snakes. And I have a letter where someone asks him about keeping crocodiles and what kind, what species are good and the same thing for snakes. But for the crocodiles, he writes, this one is very bad and this one is subject to epileptic fits, but this one, whatever it was, could be, could become a pet. And the same thing went on for the snakes. In fact, he said he always wanted us to have a snake and a snake would be the best watchdog. All you need to do outside your house is write snake loose and you'll never get any thieves. <laughs> that brings me to ask you to, you've, you've given a talk that's been in a way quite, it's been personal, but also quite dispassionate. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit about your father's personality. What was he actually like as a, as a human being? I don't, don't, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> well, no, okay. First of all, I will say that all of the, audience, I'm sure, or most of them, are familiar with the term yekka. Yes. <laughs> so he was definitely a yekka. I never saw him except a few times on the beach. I never saw him without a three-piece suit. Now, even when he went to Central Australia, which is terribly, terribly hot, he wore a three-piece suit. And not content with a three-piece suit, he also wore spats. And spats, of course, are, people don't even know spats anymore these days, but anyway, spats. He was, yes, quite meticulous. Um, he also enjoyed cooking very much. And he used to make wonderful Berlin apple cake, we called it, and Berlin apricot cake with our apricots. And I remember him beating up the eggs for the cakes and he always used, used to recite um, Homer while he was beating up the eggs. 
Yeah. I was going to say earlier that I have a strong suspicion that that generation of individuals who had this extraordinary range of erudite and other interests is, is, is no longer with us. That actually, that I suspect I may be wrong, but in anthropology, as in other fields, you know, the temptation or the, the kind of move has been towards ever greater specialization in small areas. Right. But that kind of broad, yeah immensely cultured view of the entire range of human activity seems to me very typical of that generation. Uh, would, you, yes. would you agree with me? Oh, I do. Yes. Let me just say a couple of, couple of things. Um, to the person who was writing about the snakes and that it was going to be published in the newspaper, he wrote, um, please do not publish my name because I don't want people to know that I'm a jack of all trades. Well, it's just what you're saying. People specialize, they're not a jack of all trades, all the different subjects. It's hardly and the right that, term, is it? But uh, yes, yes. No, but, and the other thing is with primitive art and his beautiful sketches inside the book, the Pelican editorial people wanted to write, when they write the information of the author, they wanted to write on the back that being an artist himself, he had a special affinity with artists. And he said, no, 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 don't put that. I'm not an artist. All I am is a skilled draftsman. That's very much an underestimate, isn't it? As I say, yeah. I, mean, I find them just beautifully pleasing as, as images. Fabulous yeah. indeed. Indeed. We have a question, um, changing tack again slightly. Um, uh, could you tell us more about this theatre play you mentioned? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Glenn Shea, the playwright, is actually an Aboriginal playwright and he comes from the same place as Roland Carter. So he's extremely interested in that. Roland Carter was the Aborigine, one of the two Aborigines that my father met in the camp in Wunsdorf and they became very close friends. And Roland Carter disclosed all kinds of maybe he shouldn't even, secret things to my father, which my father published in the early 1920s in his um, Journal of Comparative Law. But he published them because the missionary in charge of the mission where Carter lived had written, I think in about 1913, I'm happy to say that all those disgusting Aboriginal traditional customs have been wiped out. The Aborigines no longer, no longer practice those terrible customs. And of course, Carter said to my father, that's not true at all. I've witnessed some of these things myself. And he told my father what he'd witnessed. So my father then published those in the 1920s and not long ago I went to the law library at the University of Vienna and I found that particular volume and Robin Sloggett and I brought it out and we published it not so long ago. Wonderful. Um, perhaps you should begin drawing things to a close but do tell us what the time scale for your book is. Where, What stage are you at? Well, we're actually at the end, and I think being at the end is very, very difficult because you don't know how exactly to wind it up. So much, there's so much, so many details. So I hope that it will come out before long. We do have a publisher and... Who's, who's the publisher? May we, may we know? Uh, Melbourne University okay. Press. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Well, will you keep me keep me informed, and I will spread the word about it as much as I I can. Lovely. Any more questions before we round things up? Um, several people having to leave early. Thanking you very much indeed. All right. Well, perhaps we will end. Uh, there's clearly a lot more that could be said. A uh, remarkable man on so many different levels. Um, somebody was asking about whether the talk has been recorded. Yes, it certainly has, and it will be uploaded within a week or so, possibly even earlier, onto the insiders 
out, uh, Outsiders YouTube channel, which you can find very easily by simply Googling it. And if I could just point you to that also, because as I mentioned earlier, there are many talks on different aspects of internment and other things besides that you might find interesting to, to visit in your own time. Um, also the website, the Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website might be of interest to you. It'll give you some sense of what's already happened and things that are happening in the future. If you look at the what's on section and resources and other things besides. And last but not least, I'd like to mention that actually partly thanks to Mary Claire, I've been in touch recently with a number of academics and uh, scholars in Australia itself who are very, very keen to work with Insiders Outsiders on exploring the kind of Australian side, if you like, of the refugee experience, not merely the Dunera and the internment camps, but also, as we've seen in the case of your wonderful father, the long term and huge contribution of the erstwhile refugees to Australia. Australian culture. And we're working towards a two-day event. We've already set the dates, although haven't yet published the details, on the 1st and the 2nd of October in the mornings only because of the very antisocial time difference between Australia and Europe. Uh, but anyway, we will be advertising that in the newsletter. Do sign up to the newsletter on the website if you're interested. Um, and it will, yes, we'll, we'll sort of uh, spread the word nearer, nearer the time. Lovely. So thank you so much, Mary Claire. That was an absolute delight and I'm sure everybody will agree yes one wants to clap <laughs> it's very very fascinating. Thank, you. thank you very much Monica for it's giving a, it's me a great pleasure it's a very great pleasure and I hope we'll keep in touch I'm sure we will and uh, I look forward to seeing the finished the finished book okay good night everyone be well and uh, good to have you with us all the best bye -bye. lovely to see friends here <laughs> bye -bye. Bye -bye. Now, one new message hold on just before we leave um Oh, okay. So I thought it was made from somebody called Tricia. Thank you, Mary Claire, for your fascinating talk. Lovely to see you. Uh, lovely. A mondial online. That's a lovely way of putting it. I mean, I, I wonder how many different countries are indeed represented uh, in this event. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the wonders of, of Zoom. Good. Lovely. Enough. <laughs> enough for one night. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.